All right, great. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all for joining the session. I appreciate it. My name is Dina, and I'm joined here today by Luke. We'll go into introductions here in just a moment. But this session is about uh, dynamic pricing and how to um, control your revenue flow beyond dynamic pricing. Um, so we'll just go ahead and get started. I'll start with uh, introductions. And um, so again, my name is Dina. I'm a revenue manager with Beyond. Um, I've been with Beyond for a little bit under a year now. Um, probably the last 10 years of my life have been in the hotel industry. Um, so I first started out in operations. I, like you, probably um, wore many hats. Um, I was involved a lot with housekeeping, reservations, uh, sales and marketing as well. And, um, and then I gradually went into um, sales. I was a director of sales and marketing for a little over three years and managed a team of 15 to 20 people at a time. And um, I think the biggest concern that we had was the empowerment of reservationists and sales. So um, they didn't feel comfortable with quoting people rates based on like low demand or quoting people higher based on higher demand. So, um, so we came up with a strategy to essentially um, set them up with a, a rate range based on revenue goals so that they feel empowered to set their rates. Um, and also feel empowered to lower the rates based on the demand, as you all know. Um, and that strategy is still in place, um, so I'm very proud of that. Um, but then my VP of Revenue was like, Dina, um, you are in the wrong position. You are into Excel spreadsheets and building tools, and, uh, and yeah, you need to join us on the dark side. So I joined them on the dark side. And I've been here since. Um, and then I joined Beyond. And I'm so in love with the vacation rental industry. Um, I have grown such a passion for it. It's so different than the hotel industry. Um, and it gives you that creativity to create those tools like I was doing. But then there was a dev team behind us to help us out and um, like put it in the tool and actually put it in place for our clients. So um, I'll pass it over to Luke so he could tell you a little bit about him as well. Thanks, Dina. Yeah. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Luke Kearns, uh, the general manager at Fall River Village Resort in Estes Park, Colorado. Uh, Estes Park, if you're not familiar with it, is a beautiful little mountain town of about 6,000, 7,000 people that balloons up to millions of visitors per year. It, uh, it's seasonal. It goes way up, way down, kind of everything in between. Uh, at the foot of Rocky Mountain National Park, so we're the, really the gateway uh, to that. So. Um, Every year, last year, we were at 4.2 million visitors for Rocky Mountain National Park. This year, we're going to be at 4.5 every year, and those are big increases. So, um, yeah, I come from a traditional uh, hospitality background. Uh, I worked with the Boutique Health and Wellness Resort for a number of years, helped launch that uh, out of Malibu, California, and then um, a little while with the Four Seasons, and then um, ventured into vacation rentals, which is a little different. But um, it's been wonderful, really get a, f um, one thing that I wasn't able to do, which I love in vacation rentals, is really get that uh, um, curated guest experience, which I think is, is quite wonderful, and uh, really kind of fell in love with it. Um, and Beyond has just, um, over the six years that I've been with Fall River Village, uh, we've been using Beyond for three of those years, and um, Without making this a sales pitch for for Beyond, they've just been um, they've been wonderful to work with. Uh, constantly investing in their company, um, great software to use. Uh, but most of all, it really helps me stay on top of the market. Um, it's like I said, when we're having um, that kind of growth year over year in Estes Park, it's been difficult to stay on, and we would be, just, quite frankly, leaving a ton of money on the table. Not only a ton of money on the table, but Beyond, you know, pricing algorithms go up for you, and they also go down. But it, it helps me stay on top of the market. So um, it's been a wonderful tool to use, and uh, hopefully I'm a real-world example, um, just a customer who's using it and really liking it. So um, happy to answer any questions that you have. Yeah, and, and like, like Luke said, um, I figured it wouldn't be as cool if you just heard some revenue lady talk all day. He's a real world example. He's been a client with us. So um, 
we'll go through Dynamic Pricing 101. Um, I'll talk about what that's like, what the benefits are of it, um, OTA dynamic channel markups as well we'll touch on, and, um, and then we'll get into live res standard and add-on fees as well. And we'll leave questions at the end, but of course I, this is super casual, so feel free to interject at any time to ask questions or if there's anything you want us to go a little bit more in depth in too. So. All right, so Dynamic Pricing 101. Um, I'm realizing more and more that not everyone utilizes Dynamic Pricing. Um, so if you do not already, I highly encourage you to do so. This is essentially an industry standard now. Um, the demand is changing. I think COVID is a really good example of that. The demand is changing consistently. Um, so what Dynamic Pricing is, is you're um, establishing a difference between weekdays and weekends. Um, apart from your seasonality, apart from different events. So if you have major holidays such as Christmas, um, Labor Day weekend, um, all of those factors are in place together, create dynamic pricing. Um, so with us, in an effort not to be too salesy, um, I wanted to go over some things that um, beyond highlights, um, because we know that you wear many hats, um, that you're not always setting pricing. Um, sometimes you don't have the time for that, and we understand that as well. It's not a set it and forget it tool. Um, you still definitely have to be in there um, setting prices, but it just cuts down a little bit at that time. So um, beyond um, automates that um, somewhat, you still, like I said, you still have to be in there, um, but it automates um, based off of three things, or I'll go. Um, that is seasonality, day of week, and events. Um, and then, of course, there are some minor m manipulations other than that as well, but those are the three main things. Um, and that helps us create um, accurate demand-driven pricing for uh, your listings in particular, not just your market, but your particular neighborhood too. Um, it is very easy to use, so it's not rocket science. I think I, when I first started, I spent like all of 10 minutes in there before I realized what I was doing. Um, if something doesn't make sense, you could hover over it and um, it will give you an explanation of what it is. So all of that is in an easy to use tool for you. Um, as far as markets go, we understand that markets are all different. Um, and I think as a revenue manager, this is like the coolest thing for me because we all, the entire revenue team hand creates these markets. So what I mean by that is we literally go into Google Maps and we grab a market and we say, hey, this seems like it would be a good market. We m ensure that it has at least like 100, 150 listings so that the algo works correctly. Um, but then we create that polygon, we scrape all the data, and by scraping data, I mean um, scraping occupancy, availability, all that good stuff. And um, once that is created and launched, we set all the hyper-local events and national events. So you have your larger events, such as Christmas, New Year's, um, and then you have smaller events like festivals, Coachella, um, any type of festival that would have a demand generation in your market. And we launch it. Um, so all of this is looked at by our entire team of revenue, um, and we wanna ensure that the data works correctly for your particular market. Um, as far as market data and insights, um, you probably have some form of this already, um, but insights is what we use to look at prior year and future data. So you could get as granular as you want. You could go by month, weekly, or daily. Grab like May 15th. Um, you could see what your occupancy ADR was in the last two years, what it looks like for your future, and also what it looks like um, same time last year, so in the same booking period last year. So it could get super granular. I mean, it depends on how much you want to put time and effort into it, but it's all there available to you. So uh, really, really cool stuff. Um, and also world-class support. So Claire, who's the manager of our team, um, I think she does a super good job. We take pride in having a human aspect um, with our technical support. Um, we have a system in place so that if someone writes in with like a revenue question, that question is going to the revenue team. Um, and, we're, and it's being answered by the revenue team before the, the customer manager writes back. 
if you have a question about product, it goes to the product team. So there's no bots or anything like that. Any, there's no automation. Um, we believe in having that human aspect in place because we know the urgency um, of your properties or your listings, and we want to make sure that we answer as soon as possible. So um, yeah, so we take really good pride in that. Um, I think for dynamic pricing, um, there's a lot of things that could go in place, and I'll let Luke kind of, so Luke, I know that you used dynamic pricing. What did you use beforehand, and what was your process like? Yeah, the process that we used before was, um, like you said, this has become pretty standard, but it was, um, it was really fixed pricing, for lack of a better term. Um, we'd sit down with, sit down with property owners and determine their pricing 12 months out of the year, plug it in our system, it would be fixed, we'd run with it. They would give me a little latitude about, you know, if I could go up or go down, but we, you know, it's a little easier said than done to, you know, to bump up or bump down. Um, we, you know, you have to go into our system, it's a little tedious. Um, and to, you know, to plug those new prices in. Um, but so that's what, we, that's what we did before. And it was difficult to manage on the day-to-day -day because there are, there's really are day-to-day -day swings. Um, like for example, um, Estes Park, it's not to start off with a, a, such a bad doomsday example, but we had last year, exactly at this time, one year ago, we had to evacuate the entire town. We had devastating forest fires, the worst in history for Colorado. We had the worst forest fire, uh, wildfire in history. And then right next door to it, a few hundred miles away, we had the second worst. So I mean, people were like not exactly flocking to Colorado, right? Or especially to our area. I mean, Estes Park was on like CNN, right? So um, does it make sense to stay fixed? Again, that's a huge example, right? That's, a, that's gonna be a massive swing. But there's other smaller examples within that that are saying like, Weather trends have been bad. We've been getting a ton of snow, for example, or it's been really hot, or it's been really dry. You know, take your pick. Um, but I'm not going to be able to determine that when I'm when I'm forming the budget in you know at the end of Q3 or whatever it's going to be. Um, I have no idea what it's going to be like a year down the road and what the markets are going to do. And you know, forget about the economy and all that. So. Um, Anyways, it's a really long-winded answer there. <laughs> Sorry about that. But um, just to kind of give you an idea of our thought process around it is like, no, we do have to be a little flexible here. And to stay with this, stay with that fixed pricing, um, difficult to manage. And then also we just realized, um, I mean, the numbers are the numbers. We were leaving a tremendous amount of money on the table. No question about it. And that's, that's quantifiable. So. And I have a follow-up question yeah. with that. How much would you say you spent on pricing before versus pricing now with Beyond? How much did we spend on pricing? Yep. So if you would give like a week's range, like several hours a day down to how oh, hours how, a day? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, spent less time for sure, but not like that much time. I mean, for what we're getting in return, um, I would have to crunch the numbers on it, but it's, it's not even close. It's really not. And it's, uh, um, we were spending time in different ways, I guess, um, trying to navigate, you know, the pricing matrix within, within LiveRes versus, um, you know, what you're able to do just on a day-to-day -day calendar. I mean, in beyond, you could really go in and say like, look, this, look at the insights that, again, Dino was saying, you could get incredibly granular. I mean. I haven't even scratched the surface. I haven't really needed to, um, but um, it's really approachable. You could navigate it quite easily. You could go in there and say, like, look, this unit has been underperforming um, this Saturday and Friday. I want to drop it, you know, say like 10% off the base price or or off the um, the minimum rate, or, you know, however you want to do it, and uh, you know, give it that little extra nudge. Um, so it just seems like. A, the time that I'm spending on it now is just way more, way more pointed and way more effective. It's just a lot more efficient using those tools. So yeah, it's it, that's the thing is um, it, we um, make recommendations based on your market, and the reason why I asked that was 
that we make those recommendations for you. But at the end of the day, you are the best advocate for your own market. Um, you still have to like go in there. Um, you know that a specific conference is coming up. Um, for example, Deloitte, they don't post any of their conferences. You know that this conference is coming up and it could be dependent on demand. Um, if a uh, wildfire happens, if um, some type of natural disaster happens, um, you know, all of those algorithms are in place to give you the overall framework, but you are still in control of your listings, um, which I think clients really like. So we have an example up here of what flat pricing would look like. Um, as you could see, um, you could see the spikes, which are like the different holidays. And then you could see um, where, for example, clients set seasonal minimums. Um, minimums we have in place, that's your absolute lowest that you could go, um, that your owners say that you could go, whatever it may be. Um, but with this flat pricing in the shaded areas, you could see where in low demand periods you're possibly um, pricing your listings a bit too high, and then vice versa in peak seasons where you're leaving a lot of money on the table. Um, so, and then I'll go to the next one, and this is where it changes, right? So for this particular client, um, unfortunately, they were leaving up to 40% um, on the table for their peak season. Um, they increased their revenue um, the first year that they started with Beyond. Um, but you could see where these, where these um, seasonality changes take place and you could see all these events. This in is in comparison to their market. It takes into consideration like their bedroom, um, their event pricing based on their bedrooms, what type of listing you have, um, and then vice versa. So uh, in lower demand periods, it may not be the best idea to have the same minimums in place that you have in your summer. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, and those lower demand periods, your, um, you know, your goal should be capturing at least the market average occupancy. Um, and then anything beyond that, um, you could add ADR to. But in those lower demand periods, um, that's where um, usually you have the most area of opportunity. So with this particular client, it was approximately 40% in overall revenue. And then for their lower, um, low demand season, they saw an increase average of about 12% in occupancy. Um, so massive change here. So industry standard now. Um, so if you don't use it already, definitely encourage you to do so. And uh, Beyond helps you automate that. But like I said, you still have the reins on your, on your own pricing and your own listings too. So... Um, so takeaway, if there's anything that you take away today, if you use dynamic pricing or a tool, um, you, it will immediately respond to the supply and demand in your market. Um, sometimes you don't do it quick enough. Again, you may wear many hats. You may be stuck in housekeeping. You may be stuck in your restaurant. Um, tools like Beyond will help you um, accomplish those changes without devoting as much time to sitting in front of your computer and seeing what reservations are coming in. So, yeah. Okay, so dynamic channel markups. This is a little bit newer. Um, um, with dynamic channel markups, they're dynamic OTA channel markups. So dynamic online travel agency channel markups. This depends on the fees based on the channel that you're using. Um, so at Beyond, we use DCM. So I'll try not to use DCMs, but if you hear me saying it, just know that we're just using it interchangeably. Um, this is... Um, this project was put in place by Ryan, who's also on our revenue team. Um, Ryan spent up most a year putting this tool in place with the dev team, and it has rolled out so well, and we are the first in our industry to use it. Hotels, airlines, they, they already use it. Um, and so the vacation, it just made sense for the vacation rental industry to have that in place. Um, and what that means is, for those of you that don't know, just based on the booking fees um, that you have in place, whether it be from like booking.com and such, um, you could actually put in a channel markup to eat that fee um, and at the end um, bring in additional revenue to you. So if you're reporting um, revenue that you've gotten from a channel, uh, for example, your ADR to your owner, it's not your true ADR um, because the fees aren't paid yet. So. Um, so um, dynamic channel markups will, will help you have that in place, that strategy in place. So, okay. So the problem here is uh, many have to set and forget it. Um, it's uh, a, not a good strategy to have, but it happens a lot. Again, you wear many hats. Um, so you have that set and forget it strategy, you may lose 
sight of um, where your ADR go is going or where your specific fees are going per listing. Um, the utilization of markups is already an accepted thing. Um, you could um, change it based on lower demand, uh, based on higher demand. So I'll give you an example. For lower demand periods, um, it doesn't quite make sense to have um, a higher channel markup. You could probably eat a little bit more of that fees to capture the occupancy and vice versa. For higher demand periods, you could completely turn it off and not have any third party reservations coming in and accept everything direct. Um, so it's completely up to you how you want to utilize that. Um, with the solution, um, it, it still, it still um, responds to the, the change in supply and demand, um, and it involves your revenue management strategy. Again, it's a little bit more granular just than just basic dynamic pricing, but it's essential, especially as your market becomes a little bit more competitive, more um, investors are getting into the uh, um, real estate and short-term rental industry. It's good to have these complex um, markups in place. At the end, it will be to your bottom line, and your owners are going to be happy about it. So, um, here we have a, a bit of an example. So, it might be a little bit small, but for high season, again, I'll just kind of reiterate. I, I kind of already said this, but um, why sell your inventory on third-party websites over the holidays if you have a guaranteed 100% during Christmas or New Year's? you want to turn off those third party companies and accept everything direct if you choose to do so. If you don't choose to do so, um, and you still know that you're getting to that 100%, it, I highly encourage you to use those markups because I guarantee you, especially your repeat guests, they'll be willing to, um, they're used to a certain rate, but anyone that's one off traveling back and forth in a driving market, for example, they're just looking for the best place with the best experience, especially during the holidays. So utilize those markups as you can. Um, for low season, you may be overpricing. So um, so those, those fees that you use for OTAs, you could kind of drop those and make them so that they're a little bit more competitive with your market if you're looking to capture some of that occupancy. So uh, Luke, I know that you use uh, OTA channel markets, but like, yeah. what was it like before that, and how has it changed your process? I think what it was like before, it was really difficult to track like, how much was going out to these OTAs, right? And they all have different fees. You know, Airbnb is one, Booking.com is another. Um, it was difficult. So there, there was having to track that was a time suck, and because I... Cause I you know, stickler for metrics, I want to know exactly how much is being shelled out to these guys, to these OTAs. And uh, so when this came about, um, you know, it was always in the back of my mind, like, why are we taking a hit for these guys? This is just like ridiculous, you know? So um, when this came out, it was just like, yeah, of course. I never turn it off. I'm not taking a hit for if someone wants to go book through an OTA. Like, we do our best to educate our guests about booking direct. We'll do our, we just, we're like, hey, like next time, you know, book directly through us. And, um, you know, it's kind of that necessary evil that it is, I guess. But, um, yeah, so we never take it off. It's always there. Um, and, you know, just depending on the channel, you know, it takes X percent or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's, it's been great. And then that way, since, again, I know you, Dina, you had mentioned that you could turn it on, turn it off, and that's also, that's just one method, one, you know, ideology, but, um, yeah, we just kind of leave it on, so um, we know what our ADR is, if it's, we always know what our ADR is at that point, you know, property to property, so. And this is an example that we're talking about. This is um, from one of our clients in Amelia Island. Um, as you can see here, like Luke mentioned, you could um, see which listings that you have synced on and off, in this case, they have a total of 48 listings. 46 of them have uh, dynamic channel markups, while two of them do not. Um, and you could also filter it, right? So you could filter it by uh, what market you're in, if you have multiple markets in your portfolio, um, and also by bedrooms as well. So it helps you kind of drill down where your areas of opportunity are and then uh, where you're succeeding the most, and owners like to see this too. Hmm. All right, perfect. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, we have 89. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to see if you're saying you know your ADR for every property. Sure. Um, 
Sure. That's a different scenario if you've got 30 different candidates. Right. So we're, we're using Beyond. Uh, we've been there for, I don't know, three months, maybe four months, maybe a little longer. The question I have is um, we're obviously seeing some properties where the um, dynamic pricing is working because when we had a, what I would call a static price of $600, selling that property for $1,100 a night, um, and people are, people are buying it. Um, but there are other properties where the static price was $300, and the dynamic pricing markup is sometimes 500 and something, and it's not a 500 and something dollar a night property, and I can tell you that, and so we're not booking those properties. So my question is, Okay. Yeah. What is the what is the best way to we don't want to lose the bookings. Of course. The price point is too high. And we also don't want to tick off our owners because now they're like, why don't we have bookings right now? So what is yeah. the best way to do that? Because when I was originally setting things up and I put a maximum price, I was told not to do the maximum price just to let the system do its work. And we've kind of been doing that. Sure. I have a question before I kind of allude to an answer. So, um, did did you did you lower your base price? Um, and it and it makes sense in some cases, and sometimes it doesn't. So we were lowering our base price, but we were lowering it so that the weekend sales were the holidays weren't completely outrageous for the property. We weren't seeing the charges. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. I could kind of, I have a few comments about no, that. And no. then, of course, too, I mean, real life example here. What it sounds like to me is that your minimums are too high and your base price is too low. So what happens is, for those of you that are not aware beyond, we have two prices that you set. You set your minimum price, that's your absolute minimum. And then you set your base price, which is the essentially the average that it fluctuates above or below. Um, if you see pl flat pricing, that's an indication that your price um, maybe uh, your minimum price may be too low. So what I would consider and what I tell everyone that has that specific um, issue is to look into seasonal minimums, right? So in case, in case you have like, what is your minimum right now, if you don't mind me asking? Um, it really just depends on the property. Okay, so let's say like 200, right, for a listing. Um, if you have a $200 minimum, would you still consider that $200 minimum during lower demand periods? Or are you willing to go higher during higher demand periods? So we have an annual minimum pla in place, but then you could also, apart from that, set a seasonal minimum where you're willing to go slightly below um, during lower demand periods. Or you could have a, a slightly lower minimum annually and set your seasonal minimum during your peak seasons a little bit higher to have it fluctuate. But it sounds like to me that flat line, that means that your minimum is, see, that your annual minimum is too high and your base price is too low. Did you have something else to add to that too? Yeah, no, I think those are, those are all excellent points. Um, I was thinking just um, actually to a couple other of your questions or your comments that, um, you know, I think the number one of the biggest things to understand is that you know your property is better than anyone else, right? That's like that's really important to keep in mind. And I think I know speaking for myself, like when I came to Beyond, it was kind of like, wow, they're like with the algorithm and everything, it's just gonna like it's gonna transform. And it did, but it, at the end of the day, you know, like I'm the boots on the ground. I'm the one that's there. Like like you said, that's not a five hundred dollar a night property that's a $300 a night property. And like, you always have the ability to override that as you probably already know. Um, so I think that's just like always important to keep in mind that it like does a ton of work for us um, as, a, you know, as a management company or, or, or for the owners. But um, it, yeah, just really important to keep in mind that like at the end of the day, if you know it's not that kind of property and you have a hunch, Set it at what you feel comfortable at. And then also the beginning stages at like three months, still kind of 
learning the system, I would imagine, right? I mean, it took me a very, very, very long time just to get all like, not because it's complicated, it's extremely user friendly, but there's a lot going on there. And, you know, to manage a, you know, 30 properties, 90 properties, whatever it's going to be, it just takes a little time. And I would, what I did for the first year is just like, kind of mess around with it <laughs> and throw something out there, see if it sticks uh, and say like, well, I struck out on that one, uh, struck out on that weekend for this property. And then, you know, another time, you know, take the information and then use your own know-how or use your own knowledge about the property to, um, you know, make the final say on it. Um, so again, it's, I think it's a little bit more high level, but you know, um, I would just say, just keep that in mind that at the end of the day, you know, you have that intimate knowledge of your own property and then um, take what beyond is putting forth and then it's a collaborative process, right? Go ahead. And the, the other thing that I'd just like to add on that is, sorry, I hope I didn't interrupt you all. I'm, it's like everyone's having a good conversation, but um, that, you know, this is an agreement, right? Unless you've totally bamboozled them or like sold them the, like the wrong product, right? Then it's like, you didn't force them into renting your property. And I'm saying that, and it's, it's, it is, it's an agreement. They, if you, you in right effort and honestly, put all your best assets, all your best, um, you know, you try to describe the property properly and then there are, you know, the uh, correct photos that uh, properly show the, the property, then it's like, you know, maybe the market is just there. So, I mean, that's maybe a good problem to have. I don't know. <laughs> exactly.
I mean, honest to goodness, like I've been doing this for 20 years and like probably I hadn't raised my rates in some of my properties for like eight or nine years. I mean, and so, which was absurd. So this was like that catalyst to say, okay, check yourself, like what else is out there? Like you've been doing this for so many years and it's hard to swallow that. It, and so I think I just changed my mental mindset. Like, okay, well that makes sense. Like, I mean, I've been charging $200 for this unit and it really should be running for 450 and it should have been running for 450 a couple of years ago. Yeah, you lost a lot of money. I, I, but I, I have some experience, almost the same. I, mean, yeah. I, I still don't work with the on pricing. I do all the, I change my rates by itself. I mean, every person. But uh, I have a, two condos. They're the same resort, same area, one bedroom, one bathroom. But there's one that always rents more. And I mean, since the past year. And then I'm like, I'm like just miss with the price. And I bump to like 40% more than the other one. And then we still rent more than the other one. And I bump like 10%, 15%, more, and it still rents more. So this is a property that hurt more no matter what. And both of them are exactly the same. But one of them rents more than the other one. And the other one, I actually lower the price more than what I used to have, and it still doesn't match. So I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what's I have the same channels, we have the everything is exactly the same. What about the color of pillows? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, to, yeah, so that matters. I love that. And the point that you bring up, you brought up too, is changing your mindset. And you had mentioned something. You are aware of lead time of your properties. And I'm a major advocate for lead time. Many times owners don't really understand the concept of that. Um, so what you're doing with your lead time, for those of you not aware of what lead time is, it's your average time that your bookings come in, right? So if your average booking lead time is 45 days out, you should not be decreasing your rate before that. You should not at all. If you want to play around with the rate, increase the rate just like others said, sometimes you do have to change that mentality. And then at the end of the day, if it doesn't work, you could try a different strategy. But I think changing your mentality, and it's based on supply and demand, you may get a booking that it would be much higher than, than you have. And then if not, I know other beyonders are going to cringe at this a little bit. You are still in touch with your market. You know your market best. If you get closer and closer, there's always manual overrides in place. There's also discounts in place. Um, so beyond doesn't take away those reins from you. You could still charge the rates that you want. But I highly encourage you to, the thing is sometimes when you book too low, you book up too quickly. So the next year, um, when you have those higher ADRs, your booking lead time is gonna go further out because they're trying to cap, the algo is trying to capture those clients who are willing to pay more for your property rather than Joe, who's only willing to pay a quarter of what you price it for, if that makes sense. So really good conversation here. Go ahead. So are, are you asking about like a channel manager through Beyond? Yeah. Got it, got it. I'm just thinking about, like, this is kind of out of my wheelhouse, really. really I, not, uh, <laughs> but um, I'm just thinking of the, the ways that things flow from beyond into live res. Right. And maybe being that it's a direct stream from pricing and beyond to live res is, I don't know. I, I actually, I have to admit, I'm not quite sure. Is there anyone here that has experience? Go ahead. Uh, to my knowledge. Based on 
do I feel like I can still leave calendar days on my direct site, right? Yeah. I don't want to deal with an OTA traveler at this point because for Christmas, I can book it myself and I can get that direct booking. So that's where the dynamic channel markup works in because increase the rate of Virgo, increase the rate of Airbnb, increase the rate of home to go and wherever else during Christmas, during you know your peak right. foliage season, okay. whatever it is, and then lower it during the times when you really need to rely on OTAs to fill those calendar days. So you could do it on a listing level. Um, and then I believe, and if I'm wrong, then I'll reach back out to you, but I'm almost like 90% sure. If you want to do it a blanket, there's a way that we could bulk upload it for you. Yeah. I think I can approach that. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, you have a discount or a premium? We have last minute discount. Last minute discount. Okay. So we drop it by 30%, we're still not getting filled. And it could just be, I mean, it's, we're in an early market, so we didn't have an employee that was going crazy and said, guys, have you seen the bottom of CQ? And nobody wanted to go with the interest. So we're still finding, okay, how the hell do we fill the, this weekend when we've dropped 30%? Yeah. So we're going in and doing manual overrides to fill, we just did it this morning, we went through a few properties we didn't fill this week, even though we're at 30%. So but the pacing is good to clarify. It's not yeah. like we're we are filling out. We know it's not the base rate that needs to be adjusted. Like got it. But you're filling out less than the, than you want to. No, I mean we're filling out fine. It's just that the yeah. last minute don't seem to be. Um, we're still losing these dates. Like yeah. got it. You know, last minute but it feels scary to drop the like you know thirty five forty percent. Well, yeah, of course. It will never fall below never those minimums. Below that, yeah. yeah. And we do, when we do that, we do override lower. <laughs> because we're like, we gotta get that in now. Got it. And that then says that you have yeah, Google Earth to go below the minimum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd be interested, I could talk to you after. I'd be interested to look at some of your insights in particular um, because that's not a case that I often see. So maybe we could look at it a little bit further after and I can make some recommendations. Yeah, good questions. Anything else? I think you said something about uh, withdrawing your listings from OTAs so you could book them direct over the holidays? Yeah, so um, if you have repeat guests or you know that you're going to hit that 100% mark, um, very common in both the hotel industry um, and the vacation rental industry. Now, Luke, for example, he doesn't turn his off, but he increases it more for holidays. So you could either choose to increase or turn it off altogether so that you're not paying those fees. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mark? Yeah, I just want to speak really quickly to, uh, to you and Zach. So completely understand if you have owners that, or, or guests, where you, you're afraid to potentially put them into a unit for 500 a night if it's really a 300 a night unit. Dina talked about being able to set seasonal mints. You can set seasonal matches too. Um, so we don't have a ton of clients that do that because obviously they're looking to get top dollar, but you do have some owners that are a bit reticent to charge too high. So you do have the ability to put in flooring and fans as well. Perfect. Love it. Love it. Okay, I'm going to hop into LiveRes. Um, LiveRes has some great um, different add on fees and um, standard fees that you could have in place. Um, so this is an example of a client who has several fees in place. Um, I think they have a variety of, um, I, I don't know where Jessica is, like over 120 different fees um, based on their listings and based on different things. Um, so what the standard fees are is these are the fees that are rolled into the rent prior to you sending it to the, prior to the owner statement. Um, it's considered hidden, so the clients don't see it. Um, and we highly recommend having these fees in place. Again, big um, industry standard now. It's well accepted among several short-term vacation rental owners. So if you don't have fees like this in place, I encourage you to do so. This includes like trash pickup, um, any anywhere where you feel like there's some cost in place um, that offsets your bookings or that you have to pay. 
um, would encourage you to put it in place. Um, I know with several clients they have, which I'll go into, it's not so much standard fees, but I'll go into like upgraded services as well. I was just in a session yesterday um, where I heard that they wanted to dig into a listing even further because they couldn't figure out why it was being booked so much. And it turns out, and it was a, a beach market, it turns out that they were selling those listings more if they had a blender included or for the listings that had blenders included, which is crazy to me. But you you, you look at these different add-ons that you could have in place and you could charge premium for it um, if you know that you have certain things like um, gift packages like you're talking about, um, anything that you feel could scale the revenue per booking would encourage you to do so in live res makes it super easy. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. And anyone here from live res, correct me if I'm wrong. So there is a cleaning fee. Um, so I'll start from the top. So the convenience fee, obviously the cost of the booking fee, um, you have your cleaning fee. So if you're paying housekeepers to clean your room, um, you could break down your pricing per minute that they're cleaning, and you could offset that in the booking price, right? So you're paying your housekeepers at the same time. Also feel free to add in too. Yeah. Um, different inspections happen um, that also you could calculate the amount of time and the money it takes into it. So you take the time divided by how much it is. You could include that in, as a booking fee as well. Um, you could include um, linen, for example, the cost of lim linen, gets to be very pricey. Um, I'm sure it's the same in the on the vacation rental industry. I know it was for the hotel industry. Uh, trash pickup from the room, from the property as well, um, as well as any specific things that you do for arrival. So if you have a, a um, some type of package uh, in place for arrival, your reservationists, um, all of those you could break down into like minute little fees that you could have in place. Jessica, oh. Oh, perfect. Okay. It looks like we're running out of time, but I'll, so I'll try to speed it up. Does that kind of answer your question? So Jessica, do you have, do you have, uh, the different acronyms? So I know ADP is probably like, um, likes different inspections in place as far as, um, COI and CFO. Jessica, do you know what those acronyms stand for? So does that make sense? You could you could customize the different fees that put in place in this particular client or account has those fees in place. They just named it what they choose. And I think the important thing to recognize, kind of piggyback on what um, Sharon was just saying, is that um, you see these, the guest doesn't see it, right? So that's important. So it's like you know where the money is going, but you know for them, it's like for for me, like when I travel, I'd like just roll it all up. Just tell me what I gotta pay, right? Um, and you are doing that basically, but you also have, you're able to see on the back end, um, you know, it all broken out of where the money's going. So. so things, and I think we already touched on this, so I'll be really brief, but um, things like grocery deliveries, um, um, different beach packages that you could put in place like beach chairs, um, paddleboard rentals, all those are industry standard that, standards that are used now. So see what's in your market, see the different packages that are available in your market, and you could use that to set premiums to the rates that you have in place and ultimately scale your revenue. Um, uh, in particular with a live rest client, they started be, um, charging for beach chair rentals and they saw a $45,000 increase within the first year just from beach chair rentals. So it's clear that it works. Um, it's nothing to like sit and scope whether it's worth it or not. It's very worth adding these types of premiums to your listing. So, um, oops, I went back. So takeaway here is implement implementation fees for your strategy. It scales your revenue per booking like we discussed and it allows guests to customize their experiences during your stay. You could have a communication plan in place to send them an email about these different options six months prior, then again like oh, two months prior, and again, again a week prior. So you, you make those um, choices um, with what you see best. So 
Um, yeah, that's it, I believe. Is there any questions? It was a really good conversation that really helped us too. If you have any questions, just let us know.